nothing the human mind could conceive of or design or build. The satellite era has entered a new phase. Even though Newton mentally prepared for the launch of a satellite, it would be some time before we actually managed to pull it off. Science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke was one of the pioneers with a vision. Clarke proposed in 1945 that satellites may be launched into orbit to follow the Earth's rotation both in terms of direction and speed. He suggested using these so-called geostationary satellites for communications. Clarke's theory was not widely accepted by scientists until October 4, 1957. Sputnik 1, the first artificial satellite to orbit the Earth, was launched by the Soviet Union at that time. And now there has been a scientific marvel. Scientists have discovered an old satellite that accidentally turned on, and what it's found out is beyond imaginable. What did this old satellite reveal? Does it provide any insight into the origins of life? Join us as we explore this old satellite that accidentally turned on again and discovered something terrifying. The first artificial satellite, Sputnik, had a lasting effect on space exploration as a whole, as evidenced by the subsequent real satellites, the larger growth of the Soviet and Russian space programs, and eventually, the tiny orbiting ball itself. The Sputnik effect is so large that it defies logical analysis. The Soviet Union thus launched Sputnik 1, a simple ball carrying a radio transmitter, batteries and antennas into Earth orbit. It was a perfect metaphor for the first artificial spacecraft, up to a point. Sputnik 1 served science despite its simplicity. In order to monitor its progress, the Soviet Union established a system of observer stations across the nation. These findings led to the development of a new scientific discipline called space geodesy and improved understanding of the air density at Sputnik's altitudes. But many thought Sputnik 1, which didn't have any real scientific instruments, was just a space race gimmick. Sputnik 2 and Sputnik 3 followed it, and their missions were substantially more focused on science. Sputnik 2 launched the first living being into orbit, a dog named Laika, on November 3, 1957. On May 15, 1958, Sputnik 3, the real Object D, was eventually launched. The spacecraft, Sputnik 2 and Sputnik 3, represented two radically different approaches to space travel. One that used crews, although with dogs, and another that used computers. People were more receptive to the first strategy, which introduced them to the concept of space colonization in the future. The second plan called for sending in specialized robots and using remote sensing technology to do away with the need for humans all together in space. Extended human spaceflight appeared less feasible after the actual hostile space environment was evaluated, compared to when it was considered during the period of Yuri Gagarin, the first human in space, and the Apollo program. While the fact that humans may inhabit and work in space close to Earth is now common knowledge, the exact nature of the activities that require space and human hands remains unclear. One of the most significant contributions made by Sputnik 1 and its several successors was the ability to conduct active experiments in interplanetary and even interstellar space or on the surfaces of other planets and bodies rather than only view them. What keeps space science afloat is the fact that we have only scratched the surface of this opportunity. Launch of the first spacecraft occurred only four years after Sputnik 1, satisfying the most pressing wish of space visionaries to discover other worlds beginning with Venus, Mars and the Moon. Researching alien worlds with the hope of putting them to human use was a natural motivation for the earliest space explorers. Surface conditions on our neighbouring planets were, however, anything but welcoming. That could explain why the initial excitement of space travel as a human adventure quickly faded. Beginning in the 1960s, a planetary space race similar to Sputnik emerged alongside the human race on the Moon. The Soviet Union's satellite Venus was the target of their competition efforts. 
the first spacecraft to reach the surface of a hostile planet was the Soviet Venera 7 lander, which made history in 1970. Venera 9 later broadcasts the initial surface picture of Venus. These pictures, together with the ones taken by Venera 13 and 14 in 1982, are the only ones that we have of Venus right now. In addition to this feat, the Venera probes performed a plethora of tests to learn about the surface and atmosphere composition, weather patterns, and electromagnetic environment of the planet. The fact that Mars and Venus did not exhibit any telltale indicators of life and instead provided unexpectedly unfriendly habitats was a big early finding of the planetary space race. Relatively speaking, it was found that Earth's nearest planetary neighbours exhibit very different forms of greenhouse effect evolution. Massive heating has occurred on Venus as a result of its heavy carbon dioxide atmosphere, sluggish rotation, and closeness to the sun. Sulfuric acid clouds blanket the sky, which is 93 times higher than Earth, and the surface temperature is close to 752 degrees Fahrenheit. Mars has the inverse problem. Its extremely thin atmosphere prevents it from absorbing solar radiation, leading to a low average temperature. US mission data provide credence to the theory that Mars once hosted vast water reservoirs that subsequently evaporated into space, leaving the surface of the planet desolate and dry, apart from the polar regions, but with substantial subsurface deposits of water ice and carbon dioxide ice. A probable reason for these climatic variations was uncovered by the Mariner and Venera spacecraft. Neither Mars nor Venus has a significant magnetic field. Both planets likely lost water as a result of photochemical reactions and solar wind interactions. Charged particles from the sun removed hydrogen from water molecules after ultraviolet light separated them. This process occurred in an environment without the strong field that shielded Earth. Planets in orbit around other stars may also experience this same process, which might make them uninhabitable. Mars stands apart from the rest of the solar system because despite its hostile atmosphere, it is the only planet where humans have a realistic chance of surviving without heavy armour. Mars is the most visited planet in the solar system in large part due to that quality. The US and Russia aren't the only countries with Mars missions. Japan, China, India and Europe have all sent probes and there will be plenty more in the future. The Moon was another target of robotic exploration after Sputnik. Important issues are still not answered, even though research has been going on for 50 years. The genesis of the Moon is the most significant issue. According to the most popular explanation, a planetary body around the size of Mars collided with Proto-Earth, causing the Moon to form as a result. It is still possible to find data that supports the alternative theory which states that the Moon and Earth formed at the same time but independently, as well as facts regarding the Moon's composition and angular momentum that do not fit. Both the United States and the Soviet Union had automated interplanetary stations in the 1960s and 1970s. These included Luna 16, 20 and 24. The equatorial areas of the Moon were the emphasis of the Apollo spacecraft, However, some fascinating features of lunar geology were overlooked by that pragmatic approach. It seems that there is a significant amount of volatiles in polar regions, particularly in craters that are constantly shaded. These areas seem to have water ice deposits in their shallow subsurface, making them promising sites for a potential manned or robotic lunar colony. While much remained unknown, the closest region of the solar system had been explored to a greater or lesser extent by the 1990s. Space closer to the Sun than Venus, but outside of Mars's orbit, has seen less exploration. Only two full-fledged missions have visited Jupiter, Galileo and Juno, and only Cassini-Huygens, a joint NASA and ESA effort, has been devoted to studying Saturn. In 2015, New Horizons soared past Pluto and is now en route to a distant Kuiper Belt object 2014 MU69. 
the two Voyager missions provided a portrait gallery of the outer planets and their satellites. Space travel's initial excitement as a human endeavour gradually faded. However, there has been zero waning of interest from the scientific community. A remarkable memorandum reached British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan's desk on September 10, 1962. The confidential document explained what happened before the first British satellite, Ariel 1, failed. This spacecraft, which was launched in April of that year as a joint venture between the US and Russia, was intended to examine the effects of solar X-ray radiation on Earth's upper atmosphere. Until the abrupt termination of broadcasts on July 13th, this research satellite had functioned without a hitch. It was no accident that Ariel 1 went down on that particular date. Four days following the US detonation of a 1.4 megaton nuclear weapon in an experiment called Starfish Prime, 250 miles above the Pacific Ocean, the satellite failed. The electromagnetic pulse generated by the explosion, which was the most powerful high-altitude nuclear test ever, was powerful enough to knock out streetlights in Hawaii and interrupt radio communications around the world. It was this, together with the creation of a new, temporary radiation band around the Earth, that did it for Ariel 1. For half a century, official records from the British government that explained what happened to the satellite were kept secret. Space is already an electromagnetically hostile place due to the constant barrage of charged particles and cosmic rays from the Sun, which affect satellites and spacecraft. Contemporary satellites are extremely resistant to radiation, hence no electromagnetic pulse weapon, not even a sequel to Starfish Prime, could harm them anymore. Space infrastructure could be destroyed by a powerful solar storm. Nowadays, solar radiation is at least partially absorbed by all space systems that launch into orbit. While Starfish Prime did a good job of destroying 1962's rudimentary space infrastructure, there are now significantly more efficient and affordable ways to destroy today's satellite systems. For example, a GPS jammer may be yours for about $1.20. These regionally obstruct the faint signals from navigation satellites. In most countries, they are illegal or only partially legal. While they're great for cab drivers because they let them evade radar, Jammers have been a major headache for airports worldwide, preventing pilots on final approach from receiving their GPS signals. Anyway, space is littered with the remnants of human activity. Space garbage has grown into a major issue due to the abundance of objects in space. A large portion of it consists of decommissioned satellites that are in orbits too high to return to Earth by gravity alone. Do not assume that everything is over simply because a satellite has gone down. Six of them have shown that satellites can occasionally reawaken unexpectedly and on their own. These defunct spacecraft orbiting our planet are known as zombie satellites. Any satellite that starts communicating again after a long period of inactivity can be called a zombie satellite. Typically, these devices become so disoriented or unable to recharge that they become uncontrollable and the ground is unable to reach them. Then, either they start working again of their own will or the intelligent people on Earth figure out how to get in touch with them in novel ways. The most seasoned of these zombie satellites will be the one to begin with. The debut of the Transit 5B5 occurred in 1965. Before the Global Positioning System, there was Transit. The satellite stays in a stable polar orbit which is between 60 and 90 degrees from the equator and is powered by nuclear power, which increases its longevity. Even after Transit's retirement in 1996, its messages could still be heard, despite operators' inability to manage it. The Intelsat Telecommunications Satellite Galaxy 15 isn't necessarily a zombie. With a 15-year mission that began in 2005 and ended in April 2010, the operator lost control and the spacecraft drifted out of its orbital position. It appeared like Galaxy 15 was toast by December 2010. However, the satellite managed to reboot itself, allowing Intelsat to reposition it to its original spot. It was therefore completely revitalized. There is AMSAT Oscar 7, 
which is one of the records for the longest time between communications. This amateur radio satellite went into orbit in November 1974 and remained in orbit for a full seven years. The mission of the satellite was terminated in 1981 due to a battery failure. However, on June 21, 2002, after a gap of 21 years, the satellite resumed communication. A handful of individuals have made it a pastime to locate these misplaced and abandoned satellites. One of these is Scott Tilly, a Canadian amateur radio operator who has assisted NASA in contacting several of these objects, including the 2005 lost NASA probe. Let's briefly travel to the time of the Cold War. Immediate and accurate global intelligence was of the utmost importance during the Cold War as the US military was undergoing modernization. At the time, the United States had already relocated from Korea to Vietnam. The United States military could be in almost any part of the globe within a few hours, but a big problem was the unreliability of long-distance communications once they got there. In order to coordinate their air, land and sea operations, the various military branches needed to communicate with one another. To enable communications on the move with ships, planes and cars, command and control communications are required. The early to mid-1960s saw the absence of a unified tactical communication system capable of meeting such demands. The construction of modern communication satellites was primarily motivated by the need for international military communication. The story begins with the launch of the Tactical Satellite Communication Program, known as TSCP. At the start of 1965, the TSCP reaffirmed its objective of providing tactical satellite communications to every corner of the globe. Using ultra-high frequency satellite frequencies, the United States Air Force initiated a program to supply airborne soldiers with low-rate digital communications. Working with the Aerospace Corporation, the Air Force project management team designed and executed the experiment to evaluate ultra-high frequency satellite communications. The Lincoln Lab at MIT studied the consequences of RF interference. In the midst of the woods and bad weather, they sought a solution. Lincoln Lab, which had an Air Force contract to begin with, made modifications to the initial plan in order to produce the experimental satellite that would soon be launched by a Titan 3C rocket. A commercially available model was utilized as the teletype for communication. Small airborne transmitters with 1,000 watt power and solid state receivers. In order to identify and report interference, they also created sensitive technology and designed particular antennas to be installed on satellites. This led to the creation of the Lincoln experiment using the fifth satellite, also known as LES-5. June 1967 saw the spacecraft's relocation to Cape Kennedy, Florida for its scheduled launch alongside five other satellites. It wasn't until July 1, 1967 that the Titan 3C rocket was launched into orbit. The satellite was made accessible to institutions for research and testing after all tests were completed, which indicated 100 words per minute teletype, voice and facsimile communications. The military then moved on to the larger and more powerful LES-6 satellite. The LES-5 satellite's sole battery was designed to automatically turn off after five years of operation, completing its intended function. There seemed to be no other malfunctioning part on the satellite, but this one. However, the long-ago spacecraft LES-5 was found to be continuing to produce a beacon signal on March 4, 2020. It had been in orbit for 53 years and 49 years after its scheduled shutdown. In reality, Tilly was on the hunt for a secret US satellite codenamed USA-280 or Zuma, an entirely different satellite. It is highly probable that the satellite went missing during a 2018 launch by SpaceX. Like the other members of these groups, Tilly was very interested in finding the oldest satellites he uncovered the USS Transit 5B5, which is fueled by nuclear energy. American Naval Navigation Satellite that first went into orbit in 1965. 
his mind wandered to the LES-5, a far more ancient target satellite. He spent a considerable amount of time researching online before he finally found the radio frequency that the satellite used. Constructing a sturdy framework to hold a large antenna capable of picking up the frequency was the next difficult step. On March 24th, when he picked up radio measurements of the LES-5 as it orbited the Earth, Tilly finally received compensation for his efforts. But he was in for a rude awakening when he continued to examine the dated satellite. Not only was the LES-5 still floating around in Earth's atmosphere, but it seemed like its radio hadn't turned off as intended in 1972 and had continued to function with the aid of the solar panels that were still attached to it. After all these years, there's a significant chance that the LES-5 satellite will be touched again. Lincoln Laboratory, a division of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, is responsible for the satellite, but has so far declined to address the media attention around the announcement. The lab was known to have collaborated with the US military on other projects. Therefore, many saw this as proof that LES-5 was utilized for covert military research. This suggests that the zombie satellite may still be keeping some information hidden, despite being radio quiet for years. Today's humans are at last well suited to operate in space. What can be done there is the question, and science will have a significant role in providing part of the answer. Space is a special laboratory with a wealth of unexplored possibilities. The Sputnik family tree will grow much further and the upcoming update will be considerably more extensive. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.